Star Wars' canon began on April 25th, 2014, with the official discontinuing of the old expanded universe, which would now be branded as Legends. The new rule was that anything published after that date would be canon, excluding the short story Blade Squadron, which was released just days earlier. But it's my belief that the canons truly diverged, in-universe, in the comic issue Star Wars Shattered Empire No. 2, which first introduced us all to the wonderful and totally not controversial concept of Operation Cinder. This event absolutely defines the next 30 years of galactic history. When compared to Legends, Star Wars canon and all of its material has not only six films to reference, but nine films and two spin-offs plus more live action and animated series. So clearly, there's a lot more to draw from when it comes to inspiration for stories and aesthetics, and this is a big reason for differences between the two timelines. But out of all of these things, the ones that have had the biggest impact on the canon galaxy and differentiate it most from the Legends galaxy are the sequels, the First Order Resistance War. And all of the roots of this war can be found in Operation Cinder. This is where the canons truly diverge chronologically. The broad strokes of the prequel era are similar enough between canon and Legends, as the prequels and Clone Wars still exist, and the original trilogy has the three films and some different comic and novel events, but is also kind of the same when painting with a very broad brush. But it's after the original trilogy that these things get different. Canon has a whole nother trilogy taking place 30 years later, so obviously the events of the 30s ABY are so immensely different because of the sequels. There's no Dark Nest Crisis in canon, but those changes start far earlier, in the days following the Battle of Endor. Because this is when Operation Cinder begins. Operation Cinder is Palpatine's official contingency plan, to be executed immediately if he were to pass away. Beginning long before the events of the original trilogy, Palpatine recruited a young boy, later named Gallius Rax, from the planet Jakku, into his care. This was in 25 BBY, meaning only seven years after he became the Chancellor of the Republic, and three years before the Clone Wars. Palpatine was already preparing for his empire, and even its potential defeat. Rax's sole purpose was to execute this contingency, so him being inducted into Palpatine's care this early solidifies that his plan was meticulous and always in place. Gallius Rax was secretly trained for this contingency, and he protected a specific plateau on Jakku for a decade before officially joining the Empire. Flashing forward 24 years, Rax had been trained up in the Imperial Navy, and met with the Emperor shortly before the Battle of Endor, as Palpatine sensed an oncoming tragedy. There, Palpatine died, and Rax officially initiated the contingency. Operation Cinder begins, with a ton of sentinel droid messengers in thick red cloaks with Palpatine's holographic face eerily communicating their orders for the contingency. These droids were distributed to top Imperial officials, which initiated a series of deadly, immense attacks on worlds across the galaxy, notably many Imperial worlds. Following these orders, many Imperials defected because of the sheer ferocity and brutality of these initial Cinder pushes. As seen with Migs Mayfeld in The Mandalorian, he is so traumatized by his participation in the Burn and Khan Cinder campaign, but as also depicted in that same sequence, the intense, illogical military operation pushed the already fanatical Imperials much further into their fanaticism. Some of Cinder's destruction also came from mass arrays of weather-manipulating satellites placed in orbit around planets, causing mayhem for disloyal worlds and governments. But most of all, Operation Cinder was a time of fast-paced, incredibly intense warfare, with the New Republic's astrography increasing astronomically over the course of the one year of Palpatine's contingency. For example, the New Republic took Fondor, a major shipyard pretty much right after Endor, as Operation Cinder began. This allowed for significant growth within New Republic forces, as they threw everything they had at the Empire, on every single occasion they could all while forming a senate and recruiting new worlds into their cause on a near daily basis. All of this ended at the Battle of Jakku, the largest single military engagement in the entire war. 
all of the remaining Imperial forces were grouped there under the command of Gallius Rax, as the New Republic engaged them, sparking a conflict that was actually all part of Palpatine's contingency. The reason a young Gallius Rax had guarded the plateau on Jakku all those years ago is because it housed Palpatine's secret observatory, a facility with a borehole to the planet's core, allowing for Rax to use Sith alchemy to detonate the entire planet blowing it up and taking both the Empire and New Republic's entire fleets with it. This was all part of the contingency from the beginning, to lure both factions to Jakku, where they would be eliminated together. This was foiled by Brenton and Nora Wexley, though, and while the fighting lasted months on some parts of Jakku, the New Republic was victorious, and a peace treaty was signed with the Imperials. This solidified and demilitarized several small Imperial remnant areas of the galaxy, and also pushed for demilitarization of the New Republic, leading to an era of unprecedented peace and justice under a somewhat weak and decentralized New Republic. Though a lot of Imperials also departed into the unknown regions on some sort of exodus, never to be seen again. Or so the New Republic thought. So clearly, 4 to 5 ABY is a ridiculously busy single year for the New Republican Empire, to the point where it borders on unbelievability as conquering huge swaths of the galaxy from a galaxy-spanning empire over the course of just one year is a little ridiculous, even for Star Wars. But that's not to say I prefer the Legends version exactly as it is either, where the war lasted for another decade and a half. I think two to three years would have been a pretty golden range for how long it took to win after Endor, in order for Endor and the original trilogy hero's actions to still feel like a climax. But that's just me. And still, it's canon, and it happened. And I believe the Empire's efforts during this time, the Contingency Operation Cinder, in-universe would stack almost every single domino necessary for the First Order to swoop in and knock them all down. Most important for that is that this one year defined how the Empire's legacy would look. Cinder was an absolute rampage of sometimes meaningless displays of force that challenged many preconceived notions citizens might have had on what their empire looked like. As previously stated, it pushed the fanatics further into fanaticism, and made others finally see the empire's true evil, embracing the New Republic even faster, which probably also led to this war being so short, yet another reason Cinder is so significant. But what's not addressed in the immediate aftermath, heh, <laughs> see what I did there? is something seen much later in the timeline in the book Bloodline by Claudia Gray. Of course, New Republic senators came from formerly Imperial worlds, and some were formerly happy Imperial worlds, and a large chunk of these worlds and senators would go on to secede from the New Republic, forming the authoritarian, centrist bloc, which became the initial political astrography of the First Order. You see, when Operation Cinder began, it did push some formerly loyal Imperials to the New Republic, but it also split the image of the Empire in half. That's what I meant by the Empire's legacy. From the former Imperials' point of view, you had the rational, economical, industrial Empire that cared for its citizens while not being perfect. And then you had the post-Cinder Empire, emperorless and mad with rage. A clear distinction from the Empire that they liked before, even if the reason that they liked it was them being blind to its atrocities, and they maintained a respect for that earlier empire. In this way, the intensity and ferocity of Operation Cinder actually allowed for softer imperial ideology to sustain itself within the New Republic. Cinder pushed the empire's average citizens into the New Republic because they rightfully took issue with Cinder. This means both sides of the empire became significant parts of the First Order's rise, with the fanatical half descending into the unknown regions to slowly be transformed by Snoke and Hux into the First Order, and the more reasonable half condemning Cinder and joining the New Republic but holding on to the ideals of a pre-Cinder Empire and jumping at the opportunity to re-establish them with the First Order's resurgence 20 years later. Every political and societal root of the First Order's emergence came from that one year of Operation Cinder, and I feel like a lot of the New Republic's canon aspects are defined by this era as well, because it was assembled so quickly and during a time when the Empire's military evil knew no bounds, it makes sense why they'd want to separate their New Republic from the old Empire. And because Coruscant was in a state of civil war during Operation Cinder, the New Republic gained a rotating capital 
something else that grew to define its decentralized nature. And with such a sweeping, fast victory, demilitarization seems more reasonable as well. There was less of a period of holding the line for the New Republic before they'd achieve total victory. And this short period of time probably also impacted the New Republic's patriotism. Generally perceived righteous war does wonders for those who support their nation-state's patriotism, especially in a period of revolution. In Star Wars canon, the war only lasted a few years, still majorly impacting the galaxy, but bringing on peacetime and the somewhat indolent attitude seen leading up to the First Order sooner than its Legends counterpart. In Star Wars Legends, the Galactic Civil War is a whole different beast than canon, and a lot of that is because of media that sells. As I discussed in my New Republic video, media about the Galactic Civil War was really all fans had in the 90s and all creators had to base off of, and thus the war continued for years. It doesn't even fully end in Legends until 19 ABY, meaning it lasted 21 years. And that's not even including the fact that the Imperial Remnant survived for decades after that. But not even 10 years after the war's formal end, the Legends New Republic's own indolent attitude made it unwilling to respond adequately to the extragalactic Yuzhan Vong invasion. And it also fell, albeit slower than in canon. So much of the Legends post-Endor timeline is defined by the Galactic Civil War, the Empire regrouping and reorganizing countless times under different leadership to try to take down the growing New Republic. Whereas in canon, it ends only one year after Endor. The canon period of time is so different from how it is in Legends, and almost all of these changes widely lie downstream of the events of Operation Cinder. And this leads us to my biggest concern with modern Star Wars content. Operation Cinder was established in comics and later books and then appeared in video games. It was first referenced on screen in The Mandalorian, which makes sense considering that episode is only about four years on from Cinder's end. But with the reemergence of Thrawn, the prevalence of Coruscant as the New Republic's base of operations when it should be Chandrilla, and the general unwillingness to include Gallius Rax in any pre-Endor stories or even picture him, I'm a little concerned. The Aftermath trilogy was canon's first foray into the post-Endor period, and it was created with the oncoming sequel trilogy and its associated world building in mind. This was a big decision to make, as starting off the post-Endor period with a story knowing exactly what will eventually happen absolutely affected how that story worked and how it presented itself. This wasn't really an issue in the original Legends post-Endor period, as the book being published was often the furthest point in that timeline. But by beginning with the groundwork for the First Order, it kind of makes the entire era leading up to that. I can admit that the reason that Operation Cinder is the direct foundation of the First Order conflict is because that's how it was always intended to be. That was the authorial intent to bolster and explain sequel content that happens later down the timeline. Aftermath, after all, was released as part of the Journey to the Force Awakens publishing initiative. Now that's not to say there's no value in it because of that, because of course there is. There's value in Operation Cinder and the stories that occur between Endor and Jakku. They explore the meaning of war, government, family, and loyalty in beautiful ways. The characters there are fan favorites to lots of people their unique and interesting looks at the galaxy that we love, even while being strictly media that exists to support another piece of media. Because that's just how Star Wars works. Content ties into other content. We didn't just get a lot of lore about Naboo for no reason at all in 1999 through 2001. We got it to support the Phantom Menace, and it became part of the wider universe. Just like how the clearly Force Awakens supporting Operation Cinder stories are all permanently part of the canon too. But that is my concern. That Star Wars is unwilling to follow the lore established surrounding the sequels because they might have gone too far in making it support the sequels from a distance and from so many angles. Like, yes, I understand why it might be difficult to tell a story set during the New Republic period if the foundations of the First Order were laid in the very first year of that era. I'm not sure. The way that The Mandalorian has dealt with it has given me some hope. But man, they really just gotta give up on Coruscant. The capital is on Chandrilla. It is mentioned in an earlier episode of the show. Just take us to Chandrilla, please. <sighs> Only time will tell.
I personally am hoping and praying for a Gallius Rax appearance in the near future. The canon comics are reaching Endor right now, so it's possible. But the canon comics reaching post-Endor is going to be a really interesting litmus test for how canon chooses to address the aftermath and Operation Cinder events. They could build onto them, or do something different. Or ignore the period as it is already slightly saturated. I think the best example of what to do lies in the Alphabet Squadron trilogy by Alexander Freed, because this series was released later than Aftermath, and later than Shattered Empire, but took elements from both and brought them together and kind of synthesized it in a way that was really beautiful. But who's to say? Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. My reading recommendation for today is the comic Shattered Empire by Greg Rucka. It's four issues and picks up right after Endor and throws you into Operation Cinder straight away. It also features a lot of stuff with Poe Dameron's parents, which I really like, 